So, Bob, I have some emails from some patrons about borderline personality, and I thought I would read some of these emails and hear what you have to say about this because you specialize in treating people with borderline personality. It, does that sound like uh, something we could do today, Bob? We can indeed. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Who you? Who are you, Bob? I am your old friend from graduate school and also a counselor here in town in Seattle. Yeah. And your office is in where again? Maple Leaf, Maple North Leaf. Seattle. North, like, North Seattle. Yeah. And if you want to hire Bob as a therapist, you can go to bobgettle.com. Yeah. And get his uh, contact info, or you could email me or something too. So this first email is from a anonymous patron. He says, hi, Kirk, I, I would like to hear an episode about growing up with narcissistic or borderline parents. I find myself tortured by a continual sense of shame stemming from childhood. A couple of issues that have come up on the podcast have also come up in my own therapy. This idea of the undeveloped sense of self. Recently, I realized how undeveloped my sense of self has always been. This would probably be a surprise to people who know me. Anyway, because of deep shame and self-hatred and the fear of being seen for who I am, I think my life has, has often been hell. The shame eats away at me and my sense of reality. I can easily fall into a spiral of anxiety, paranoia, fear, and anger. After three years with my therapist, doing psychodynamic therapy for the first time, I feel I finally feel like I am truly aware of my problems, yet my therapist tells me that I've been avoiding delving into the shame and that I should not reduce therapy, which I can't really afford anymore, mm. and that doing therapy is the only way to reclaim my sense of self. So that's what his therapist was saying. So, Bob, uh, let's break this down here. Any, any initial reactions to his email? Yeah, very articulate. This okay. is a person who knows himself and... I particularly appreciate uh, his uh, curiosity and interest and um, what's the word for it? You know, like when you uh, take charge of a thing. Uh, go get itness proactivity. Proactivity about his own well-being. Yeah, yeah. What is it like, do you think, to grow up with narcissistic or borderline parents, you know? Um, your what what do we imagine for a young a young boy would that be like do you think i think it's a uh, a life of learning how to accommodate the other Interesting. the other being the parent and not having a sense that that, that my own uh, want desire feeling about a thing is primary and I learned to manage my feelings and my own desires based on the feelings and desires of the parent. And often it's the dad show or the mom show. Interesting. So that is the conditions that result in what we call a lack of self. The self being a reference point or a sense of what I want and who I am and and this is how people see me. And when you're, uh, when you're ignored by a narcissistic or borderline parent, and uh, uh, so not only are you ignored and neglected and not um, noticed and reflected upon, but you're also needing to really pay attention to them because if you don't, they can have reactions that can scare you and hurt you. And so... Uh, you need to be really vigilant on the other. And that's what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm not thinking that um, being vigilant on the other actually protects us from reactions. <laughs> My own experience yeah. is that they just happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> but we could imagine that uh, paying attention might help to yeah. reduce at least the surprise of it or something or or maybe mitigate some of it, you know, just yeah. if please the other, please the, you know, please the parent. You know? Yeah. So... And then the person grows up into adulthood and still does not know who they are. And I've talked about this in the podcast before, and it's 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 something that 
I didn't really get because I do have a sense of self. Uh -huh. Is the thing. My parents were great for me when I was when I was at the developmental window in which it's normal to develop a sense of self. Pretty much like from one to four or something. It's that period of time when you're like no or mine or I want ice cream I this is me and I like these shoes and this is my favorite shirt and this is my favorite stuffed animal and you know give give me this and that you know <laughs> and your parents are there to uh, notice that and reflect that and they don't necessarily know they're helping you develop a sense of self but they have empathy and and they care and love you and and if they don't have narcissistic personality disorder or, or borderline or whatever else might ail you to um, create a condition where it's hard to pay attention to your kids, then you just parents just normally react. And so, you know, okay, Kirk, I get it. You want that. I, I hear that, you know. Um, let's think about whether or not that's best for you or sure, here you go. Or you know what? I get that you really want that, but it's it, you can't. It's just, you know. Or I see that you're really upset, or um, I see that you are tired, or you look tired, or I, I see that you are being a little bossy to people. <laughs> I'll never forget, just as a side note, never forget this. I was four years old, and I'm playing with my friends out in, in the front yard, and I come inside just to for a second, and my mom says, "You know, you're kind of bossy." <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, I had I remember this at the age of four. I remember being like, "What in the world is she talking about?" Like that that notion that that because because I was just behaving naturally, so to speak, and not reflecting, not even knowing that you could reflect on how you behave with with your friends like it did the notion that someone's watching the the quality of the way that you interact with people you know yeah and and then she's telling me something and then it calls upon my brain to ref, to reflect on how i interact with people absolutely it's just it's a you know a meta understanding of like wait so when i'm just acting normally I'm bossy, which is what I'm gathering is a bad thing. And and I didn't notice that. And no none of my friends were saying stop bossing me. But maybe they were thinking that. And so all this is swimming around in my head. It was it, I remember it being a very novel idea. Of course, at, at the age of 46 that the you know the criticisms have been in the billions, you know, yeah. or the, 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 the observations of my foibles, you know? Hmm. And so, uh, but I remember that first moment, you know, where it's like, wait, so I was being bossy. Like, and I remember really trying to think about that and, and thinking, do I care if I'm being bossy, you know, it should, and, and if I do care, then how do I, how do I change that? Cause that's a weird thought. Like I have to monitor my impulses or something around my friends. That seems like a weird practice to get into, mm -hmm. you know, aren't you just supposed to just play and act? And so that was a moment that my mom was paying attention and yeah. like reflected and didn't do so in a horrible way, you know, didn't like smack me around or anything. She's just like, you're being bossy with your friends, you know? And, and it gave me an opportunity to develop my sense of self. Who am I? What am I? And then that 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 meta practice just continues, you know, down the road. And I continually reflect on who I am in relation to other people. And you know, it's not an obsession, but it's a it's an occasional brain activity. So if you are abused and uh, or and or not uh, reflected on in that way, and or uh, you, know, you have parents that are so scary and hurtful that you have to really pay attention to them, then you never have that that rep that repetitive, habitual practice of who am I, how do other people see me, what do I want, what are my emotions, 
do I matter? You know, how do I affect the world? Um, it, it's sort of like in my head, I, I, I've been in this mode before, like when I, when I don't have a sense of self because the situation is scary to me somehow. Like I'm in a social situation in which I really just don't trust anyone around me or I'm nervous about an upcoming performance or something. Like if you asked me who I was and what I wanted, all I could say is like, I'm just terrified right now. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know what I want. I don't know who I am. I don't, all I know is that I'm scared, you that, know? That's normal. Right, right. So in that moment, I'm like, well, imagine if I felt that way all the time. That's what I imagine it feels like. You know, it's just like someone asks you. Um, and so the other thing is, is, is that I think happens for people with, you know, with this lack of sense of self is that when, as they grow older, they realize that they, that they don't have a sense of self. And they occasionally are aware of this, acutely aware of it, and become terrified of it. You know, they, they look at themselves as at the age of 25 and they see emptiness. You know, you hear this, this sense of this empty feeling. I'm empty. There's a void. You know, he, he kind of talked about this in this, in this email. You know, he says, um, let's see. I realized how undeveloped my sense of self has always been. Uh, this would be a surprise to people around me. Uh, yeah, a deep shame and self hatred. So it's so it's not only just a lack of sense of self, but it's also like a deep hatred of the self. And uh, when the self looks at the self, they don't like what they see, and it makes them feel um, uh, very distressed. So so they avoid looking at the self, you know, which perpetuates the lack of a sense of self. Right? It's survival. That's a survival function. I think anybody that develops this kind of um, way of being in the universe, really what they learn is, I'm bad, the other person is good, and that gives me a sense of control over my environment. Because humans will go for control over reality, and they'll also go for safety over just about everything else, including food, if that's what if that's what they believe is at stake. So I want to think when I listen and reflect on your patron's letter, what I think is he does have a sense of self. It's just not based on him. It's based on relation to other people. And it's difficult to look inside and know what I want when I'm busy just trying to not die. Right. And, and the benefit of long-term psychodynamic therapy, which is really the, the, what I would, what I recommend, interpersonal therapy was what I recommend for people when they want to work on this issue. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah. Well, I think therapy and uh, relational, relational therapy. Yes. Yeah. Right. So yeah. relational, interpersonal, yeah. a relational style of psychodynamic therapy, uh, and what we mean by that is you meet with a therapist, individual therapy usually, and the therapist spends a lot of time noticing you, ask, being interested in you, asking you questions about you. And also you talk about the relationship between the therapist and the client. And the client is invited to talk about how they think the therapist thinks about them. Because this is all the, the, the fertile ground, if you will, to develop a sense of self. Yeah. To, to be paid attention to, to be noticed, to be reflected upon. There, there are uh, times, uh, and again, because my parents raised me well enough to develop a sense of self that it, it doesn't resonate with me. I can resonate with a, with a number of conditions that people come to me on, yeah. and this is not one of them. Mm -hmm. I, I have to actually experience it very closely to know what, what it's like. And, and so one of the things that I've noticed over the years is for people who were uh, neglected in this way or abused in this way and don't have a sense of self, they have a really hard time even knowing what they're feeling. Yeah. They, they just don't even know. And, and, and from the outside, I'm, I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, well, you look, you look uh, sad or you look scared or you look angry <laughs> or something. And, and I'll, we'll talk about it and they'll be like, you know what? I, I, I don't really know what I feel. Yeah. <laughs> they'll, just, they'll just be like, and it won't feel good to them. You know, I'll just be like, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of frustrated with the fact that I, I don't really know what I'm feeling right now. Yeah. 
And it can take years of a therapist really spending time noticing that and making those connections and, and, and uh, throwing stuff out there like, well, maybe it's hurt. Well, how does it feel in your body? And uh, what, is, what kind of impulses do you have? This is the stuff that is supposed to be done when you're two, three, four, five years old. Your parents are supposed to reflect to you how you're feeling. Oh, you look angry. Oh, you look sad. Oh, oh, you look hurt. Oh, you're in pain. Oh, you're hungry. You know. Oh, you're tired. Oh, you're energetic. Or oh, you're bossy. <laughs> you you know? like this. You uh, want that. Yeah. Just the normal stuff that humans just are. Right. And just held a mirror up and reflected back, and also appreciated for it, right. or at least not judged or shamed for it. Right. And the idea is. Not necessarily like you're just supposed, like the kid is flipping their wig and they're throwing shit around and all you do is say, oh, you're angry. Right. Like maybe you have to discipline your kid for sure. But at the very least, you're noticing and giving a message of, I notice you, one, and two, this is how I'm seeing you, you know, and and this is what it looks like to me in terms of emotion. Right. Um, And modeling emotion yourself, you know, I'm angry and, you know, and so... All that has to be done in this interpersonal relational therapy style, and it takes a long time. Yeah. And that's what this patron is, is doing. And over time, the self develops. It, but the problem is, is that it, it, what only takes a few years when you're an infant or a toddler or a preschool age person will take 10 to 20 years as an adult, which is the um, a tragedy you know, of the yeah. whole thing. Um, so, okay. Um, he talks about, uh, falling into a spiral of anxiety, paranoia, fear, and anger. I bet. Have you, have you ever seen that in your clients? Oh yeah. What does that look like clinically? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I have a lot in common with your, with your writer. Yeah. (laughs) And, uh, I feel on the spot to say what that must look like because I'm sort of like in my therapist head and also in my just my own head. Um, one of the things that keeps coming into my head, and it's not a really, I'm not really responding to your question, which is my friendship with you as a person who has a sense of self has been one of the most valuable things I've had as an adult. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. What do you mean by that? I mean that you do not apologize for what you want or who you are or how you think, and I do. Interesting. And so what I get from spending time with you is a model, a really valuable model to me, of how to how to be an adult and how to not have shame. Huh. Have I ever told you that? Um, kind of, not in that way. Um, but yeah. In fact, I think I remember you saying this years ago when we first met. I think I remember you saying something like, you know, when I'm around you, like, I just, I just feel better. About, yeah. Like, I feel like, oh, okay, I don't have to be up in my head all, because yeah. you, you are not up in your head all the time, which I have to say, <laughs> I'm definitely up in my fucking head. Yeah, you are. It's <laughs> but, not like you're not a thoughtful person. You're... Well, uh, it's not, I mean, there's thoughtfulness and there's also like, you know, the ales. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I definitely, yeah. especially when I was younger, uh, it's gotten better as I gotten older, you know, I, I, yeah. I don't. Uh, I'm just used to uh, um, dealing with the weird anxiety and shame of just right. like, oh, I can't believe I said that thing last night mm. or something. And uh, uh, but apparently, I don't do it as much as you do. <laughs> <laughs> and so for you, yeah, I, I, I could see how that would be. Um, uh, well, I don't know. <clears throat> we <laughs> should, could compare our neuroses by how many years has each of us been in therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've been at therapy. Well, you're right. Maybe not. You're you. How have you been at therapy nonstop? Um, no, but mostly for 26 years. Interesting. I would say I'm like half and half. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been kind of. I haven't been in therapy recently, and so I've been kind of craving it. Oh no shit. Yeah. 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 But I I'm like so selective about who I want to go to. You know. Yeah. Oh, you mean to the point of um, not being realistic about picking. Kind of, um, and it's a little overwhelming to me because my my current my my most recent therapist isn't covered by my insurance oh, anymore, yeah. right? And so 
I I was like, should I just go to her anyway? And then and then I was thinking, ah, maybe I should try someone new. And it, I get overwhelmed with oh, the yeah. like, well, what if I had because I've because I've I've had therapists that I didn't realize I didn't like yeah. until like ten sessions in, right? And that ten sessions in, I'm just like, you know how have I not realized this therapist is worthless to me? <laughs> you know, and then, and then, I, and then, cause it, it takes me a while to, cause I, I give people the benefit of the doubt, sure. you know? Yeah. And then over, then over time I like, man, I've been wasting my time with this person and right. then I have to start all over again. And, you know, it's just, uh, that must be pretty common. I mean, that's happened to me. Has it? Yeah. 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 What, what happened to you with like, what, what, what made you think, Oh, this is not working. Like, what did that feel like to you? What's the criteria that they didn't meet? You know what I mean? Well, for me, they weren't following a particular model that was important to me, and I believed that they that's what they were going to do, and I think they believed that that's what they were doing, and they weren't. And what, so, what do you mean, like a like a particular model you were? Yeah, it was actually a couples therapist. Oh, okay. So I wanted the couples therapist to do a particular kind of uh, a kind of therapy with us, you know, EFT, whatever. Um, but um, what she was doing, I think, was more cognitive. Mm. And so it took us, we really liked her and we met her under a different circumstance and we thought she would be really good for us. And we saw her for many weeks um, and just in watching and seeing, seeing how things went and it's just really, it wasn't what we wanted. And so, but it took us several sessions to come to that. Yeah. 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 I mean, you got to give it a try. Because we like her personally. I still like her. I think okay. she's really fabulous. Yeah. I just don't think that she was doing what we needed. So she was focusing more on perspective and um how to change your thoughts yeah. about the situation yes yep rather than how to uh really tend to you and your wife's attachment um cycles shall yeah. we say yeah and the um and you can't just think that away you can't just be like well i'm gonna choose to to interpret that as um, not bothersome to me, you know, when inside your attachment injury has been poked at and there's no chance of, of wrangling your thoughts in those moments. No. And, and it's much more important to have a procedure in a couple that uh, uh, tends to the attachment injuries of both people that are happening in those moments. Yeah, you know? well, yeah. Um, and for both people to notice that and, and pay it again, only then can you have control over your, th once you have attachment security in those times, only then can you possibly change your cognitions. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Um, so you found another therapist yeah. that did that kind of stuff. What do we think of our, uh, the patron getting into a relationship? Um, did doesn't he mention say, that? He doesn't say if he is or isn't. Oh, um, uh well what do you think about it i think it's a really good idea interesting yeah okay I, th I think it'd be raised relationships are likely to be very painful and difficult and full of confusion you said before what does it look like and i think it looks like blank yeah like, i don't know where i am i don't know what i'm doing it might be a kind of panic where the mind just goes blank and one of the good things about individual therapy is you can just stop and wait right and just be still while the dust settles and words come yeah yeah. Yeah. So, uh, to answer my question that I asked you earlier in terms of seeing people fall into a you know a spiral of anxiety, paranoia, fear, and anger, I think of two things. I think of uh, uh, alluding to what you know the the EFT focus thing in terms of like when your attachment injury is poked at. Uh, when you feel rejected, when you feel hurt, when you feel worried that someone is going to abandon you, you, uh, we all will freak out and uh, become kind of primal, and um, and have that paranoia about like, uh, well, cl clearly he's cheating on me, or uh, clearly she wants to divorce me. Or clearly he is, you know, he's just in this to use me. Or clearly she is making plans to eventually leave me. Um, or clearly he doesn't really love me, you know. Yeah. And, and that and that that's the paranoia um, that can really last for a long time. Mm. And 
And then later, the reason why we call it paranoia is because later you look back on that time and you think, man, I was being fucking paranoid. <laughs> <You know>? like, <laughs> like based on, on really no data, I extrapolated like the worst possible scenario. And clearly I was just really hurt in the moment. And, and then I, and I went to a paranoid place, right. which if unmitigated... Un will push the other person away because you start accusing the other person, you know, give me your phone and let me look at your shit. And, you know, and well, you, you've never loved me anyway. And, and, you know, just really hurtful statements to, to the partner. And, or, or the other side, quiet, withdraw. Right, right. Well, fuck you. I, I'm not going to give in. I'll, um, I'll show you with my silence or something. And, um, or just like, I can't cope. I need to be quiet because I don't know what else to do. Right. And then that causes, that hurts the other person's feelings. Um, so I think of that. and that, But I also think of people that I've witnessed who have a lack of self. And I've seen, basically, there can be an episode of terror that I've seen people have that they will... Um, Essentially, when their defenses become inoperable and they have to look at themselves and they are staring at themselves and they hate what they see and they, they perceive themselves as being either blank or broken or just worthless um, or there's just this giant abyss and they will react with a terror reaction that I've seen that, that I, until I had seen it a number of times, I didn't know what I was looking at. Mm. I would see it happen with clients and, and even with uh, uh, people around me sometimes. And I'd be like, what, what is happening right now? <laughs> you know, what is there? They're clearly suffering in this moment and I don't know how to help them. And what it, what caused that? And is that, that, is that behind a very thin veil all the time, you know, is, is that, is that, is that terror just right around the corner for them at any given moment? And, and, um, you know, uh, the answer is to some extent, yes. And, and which is what motivates, um, the defenses and the, and the drinking and the sexing and the things to do things outward to uh, distract the self from, from that terror. And, uh, uh, and it's real terror, you know? It's not just like, you know, um, I'm afraid of global warming kind of thing. You know, it's not intellectual. It's it's in your bones. It's in your core of just like, I am falling, you know? Do you know what I'm talking about? I do. Yeah. Have you seen that in clients before? Oh, yeah. What does it look like in the session as you see it? Uh, it can look like psycho psychosis, and it's really, really bad. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, dissociation so people sort of blank out and they don't really know where they are um you know that's and it can also look like um you know shutting down withdraw numbing uh it could be an attack it could come come my way as an attack uh uh confusion i don't know those are the things that leap to mind yeah yeah you say psychosis what do you mean by it looking like a psychotic episode uh being out of reality like uh, being out of touch with what's happening in the moment. Sometimes people actually have these. I've I, I don't think I've seen this in maybe twenty five years or, uh, but sometimes people like believe like like a flashback like a like almost like a soldier having a flashback. They believe they're in the past where there's a terrible thing that's happening to them. And um, uh, I don't think that's really a good definition of psychosis. Psychosis is when you believe shit that's not real. Yeah. So, but. Um, you know, it's checked out of reality, I guess is another way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I, I always try to look for something in my life that can help me to feel it in my bones. Yeah. And that's smart. The, the only thing I can point to is when I was very young, when I was probably like three, I remember late at night I was playing with my, you know, as I was in bed, you know, expected to fall asleep. I was playing with my stuffed animals. And I remember there was this moment where I, I had this this rainbow uh, elephant, and it was my biggest. It wasn't that big compared to today's stuffed animals, you know, but it was my bigger, my bigger stuffed animal. And I remember f 
playing with I was I, I was like playing like a like they were imaginary friends, like they were real, you know, you go over here and I'll go over here, you know, I was just kind of having this conversation with them. And I remember somehow I, I got the sense like I had betrayed the, the, the elephant. And I remember almost visualizing a lightning bolt or something that came out of me into the, (laughs) into the elephant. And I felt a, just a, an abyss open up in my soul or something. It had something to do with betrayal, and it had something to do with um, just, you know, com- like the most supreme disappointment imparted on another creature of, of any time, of any place. You uh-huh. know? Like I had... I I had essentially it, it it was like but it wasn't anything I had done it was just a sense I got and I and I remember that feeling and it was terrible it was just it's a it was a terrible terrible feeling I got um and there was no soothing and I don't know how I pulled out of it I probably just fell asleep or something probably but uh mm-hmm. I, that's what I think about of just like a terrible shame a terrible guilt that I had done something bad and that there was no coming back from it and that everyone knew and it was permanent and the universe has a black dot on it because of me or some, something like that. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Well, let's take a break uh, because that was intense and let's go on to another email from another patron, but instead of borderline parents, Uh, This person has a question about having a borderline child. What do you say? Yeah, it sounds good. All right, we're back from the break. If you haven't become a patron of the podcast, do so now. Go to patreon.com, become a patron. When you become a patron, you don't have to listen to commercials, which are annoying, which are annoying. And you also get access to all of our patron exclusive episodes. So, um, so just the last sort of thing here uh, about the previous patron emailer. Uh, he, you know, he's starting to not be able to afford his psychodynamic therapy anymore. Yeah. So, what are some other ways he can, f- you know, develop his sense of self uh, without necessarily having to pay for therapy? What do you think? Do you, what, I was thinking about group therapy. Okay. Group therapy is cheaper. Yeah. Because it's, you know, and um, uh, a good group therapy, I think, you know, reenacts sort of bits of family and also one gets a sense of one's place in relation to others because there they are right in front of you. Right. Uh, a well-run group, I think, is pretty pretty damn intense. Yeah. But um, I think, a you know, a potential, at least an experiment worth trying. Right. So cheaper than individual therapy yeah what other things do you think people could do yeah what could he do i mean i was thinking that it there's he seems as you say articulate and wise in a lot of ways so i think if you wanted to patron you could talk with your therapist now about things you can do outside of therapy which is something everyone should be doing anyway with their therapists things like um having a relationship with someone and trying to be mindful of developing a sense of self like um, this is you know this i'm not telling you patron to do this but this is something you could talk with your therapist about of say you do have a partner a romantic partner and you outside of the therapy sessions when you're interacting with your partner try to really focus occasionally on how you're feeling and yeah. what, what you want. Right. Just sort of be m- mindful of that. Just sort of think, just have that question. Yep. What do I want right now? Right. Yep. I completely agree. Yeah. And um, that can go a long way. It's just, a, just that practice of, of doing that. The problem is, is if you, if, you ha- if you lack a sense of self to a significant degree, you won't even remember to ask that question. <laughs> Um, uh, but it sounds like you might patron be capable of this. 
and don't worry if you don't have an answer to it. Don't, you know, if you're like, what do I want right now? And you're like, Jesus, I don't know. Like, don't worry about it. That's fine. That's normal, even for people with a sense of self. There, there's, there, it's normal to, to be a little confused about things or to not have a clear direction. Um, but just the question alone yeah. can, can go a long way. You know, one of the things I do with my clients is I say, all right, let's play the I want, I feel game. And so I write, I want, I feel at the top of the page. And the, the idea is that I take this page with me through the week and I just check in periodically. Maybe you set an alarm on your phone uh, so that you can just check in. What do I want right now? And how do I feel? And I agree with you. Having an answer is irrelevant. You know, nobody, sometimes we don't know. And just, just getting in the habit of considering that I exist and that I might want, that I might feel is great. And then the thing that I add to that is a column where I check whether or not I asked. Did I ask for what I want? Sometimes we don't, and that's the right thing to do. That's, you know, that's what makes sense. And sometimes we don't, and it was a missed opportunity. But I can check and see, you know, did I ask? Because I could even consider asking. Like, that's actually a possibility. And then finally, did I get it? Mm-hmm. Nobody gets what they want all the time, but how's it actually going? Yeah. So that I'm getting feedback about what happens in my connections with people in the world and as I run my life, you know, did I ask for extra mustard on my hamburger? Because right. that's what I like, right. you know? Well, no. Yeah. I didn't want to inconvenience somebody. Right. That's feedback. Yeah. Right. And you're noticing, you know, yeah. and, and you're paying attention. Yep. And uh, without paying attention, the idea is is that you don't, you aren't given the opportunity to develop your sense of self, but you also have needs that spiral out of control without being even addressed by anybody right and then you feel really bad essentially and neglected and um you know you're cold because you didn't think to bring a coat or uh or you have mustard on your hamburger when you didn't want it or you know right Uh, okay next patron another anonymous person here uh and by the way listeners when you email me let me know if you want me to read your name or not? Some people actually want me to read their name. They're like, you know, read, you know, feel free to read my name. Um, but if you don't say whether or not it's okay to read your name, I will, uh, I will make my best judgment um, about that. And uh, these sorts of emails, I just will anonymize just because um, it makes sense to do that. But anyway. So, so I'm kind of saying this of like, let me know what you want me to do with that. And two, also know that if you have emailed me in the past or you email me in the future, uh, I tend to err on the side of anonymous, you know, because it's, it's like, why say the name if you don't have to? Did know? the last patron want to be anonymous and say I so? I think so. That's brilliant. Yeah, I think so. He spoke what he wanted. Ah, good job. All right, next patron. I'm in the process of separating from my husband, and one of our major issues has been the way his teenage daughter relates to me and his refusal to get involved. She and I, the teenager, she and I had a good relationship for the first few years of the marriage, and then she experienced some real trauma in her life that didn't have to do with me. And since then, she's been in uh, a very... Uh, obvious distress. She's had panic attacks. She engages in self-injury. Mm. She in, she has uh, an eating disorder. She uh, is defiant, and she is she bullies me and her and her other family members, and she threatens me and her other family members, but not her dad. I moved out of the house in large part because I'm sincerely afraid of her. She's been in therapy for more than two years now, and the anxiety has eased up a bit. There has been no diagnosis aside from general anxiety, nor any discussion of medication. The therapist had, has had limited interaction with my husband, me, and, and other uh, people in the system, and has counseled us to be patient and for us to uh, let things go even in the face of some really nasty, crazy-making behavior from the teenager. Hmm. Before I left the house, the teenager borrowed my backpack and returned it and returned it with her journal in it. And I read it. Oh, boy. It was full of descriptions of her struggles and pain, as well as detailed threats concerning me, meaning that 
in her journal she was writing that she was she wanted to hurt her stepmom. Wow. It was at this point that I moved out, and I asked my husband to read the journal and share it with the therapist. I know there's a conversation to be had about respect for privacy. Sure. I'm still conflicted about whether I did the right thing when I read the diary. I'd love your insights on this. So, Bob, what do you think? Is it okay that she looked at the, at the diary? I think at this point it does not matter. Yeah, what do you mean? Cat's out of the bag, and yeah. now you got that to deal with. Yeah. So... Um, try to, I would, I would, I would think stepping away from right and wrong in this case, and just dealing with what is the impact of this on child, Yeah. you know, like, okay, well, she's pissed. So that's what we deal with. Yeah. You know, what, what's been injured, you know, a sense of safety or trust or whatever. Um, and, uh, clearly your, the, the writer, your patron is scared and that really matters. Right. So I don't know that stepping lightly around that is a good idea. It seems like addressing it is really necessary. Right. And, and my call for um, things like this. Yeah. I've talked with a lot of parents about this issue in, because there are right now there's, even if your kid doesn't have a journal, there is a lot of opportunity to secretly view their life through their Facebook page or their text messages or their email and it's an interesting question because when we were kids, I don't know about you, but in my family, if I had, I had a journal, but my, I assume my parents never looked at it, but maybe they did. I don't know. But, um, but if I had like a secret, I don't know, a pen pal or something, and it was like an older woman or something, I, I would guess that I wouldn't feel betrayed if my parents read those or like broke into that situation, you know? And so anyway, my point is, is that I talk with a lot of parents about this issue because they'll say, so Johnny left his laptop out and his Facebook was open. And I thought maybe I should look at his, his Facebook messages back and forth with his friends or Johnny left his phone out and I wanted, I wanted to look at his text messages, you know, what, what, or Snapchat or whatever he's doing with, with these people. And I'll tell you that, that the, it's a very complicated issue. Yeah. You know, it's not like, you know, if you have a spouse, then it's a whole different thing, right? If, if you have a spouse, then I don't know, to me, morally, I, I think you, don't have the right to spy on your spouse for no reason, you know? Uh -huh. um, and it's, a, I think, a reasonable expectation that um, you should ask about that kind of stuff. But I don't think it's a reasonable expectation that when you're 10, that you, that you get to have, like, privacy in that way. Um, Good point. Maybe when you get older, I don't know. But, uh, but the other thing is that when a child is struggling severely and could kill themselves or commit violence on another person and they're out of control, then, and you've tried a lot of other things, like you've tried to reason with them, you've tried to change your approach, you've tried to soothe them, you've, you, you've got them involved in therapy, and nothing seems to be working and they're not being very forthcoming with you, then I think it's, it's reasonable for a parent to consider reading a journal in a situation like that. Um, does it make it right? Uh, I don't know. Is it an invasion of privacy? Absolutely. Is it a betrayal? Absolutely. You know, when you, when you write in a journal, you, you, especially a journal, you expect people to respect that. But I've talked with so many parents in situations like this and just been like, you know, the information you got from that journal is invaluable. The, the stuff or the stuff you got from those Facebook messages back and forth is really good data that you needed. Things like, uh, for some people, they'll actually read journals or read Facebook messages or emails and they'll be reassured. They'll be like, oh, you know, I saw this email exchange and one of her friends was trying to get her to sneak out and she, and she said she didn't want to because she just 
she didn't want to get in trouble <laughs> or something. And the parents are like, oh, okay. So I, I'm reassured by what I uh, spied on, <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. Um, and then they can calm, it calms them down a little bit, you know? So kids out there, plant a bunch of false information in, in your emails because that will, and your journal, and that will uh, <laughs> uh, allow you to get away with more stuff, I suppose. Um, but uh, so it's, it's a complicated issue. And I, I'm guessing there are circumstances, I, I, yeah, maybe there are even listeners listening who are like, hey, when I was 15, my father broke into my room while I wasn't home and, and like broke into my locked journal and read it and, and I, na- I never forgave him. And although we were having conflict, there was no reason why he should read like my private thoughts of my developing sexuality and my my own um you know inner thoughts like that was uh like i never i never forgave him for that there was no justification for that did he ever apologize yeah so so uh so i'm not saying it's like an easy thing to to comment on but i i i do see both sides i guess is the thing right um so she can she can address both. She can address both the information she got, which she's very concerned about, which I think is a very good idea. Yeah. And she can address whatever her stepdaughter's feelings are around the fact that she read it. The stepdaughter left it in the backpack. There's always the possibility that she had ambivalence. Maybe she wanted stepmom to read it. Yeah, it's a little... <laughs> it's just impossible to know. <laughs> right. It's a little interesting. That it is interesting. You would leave a, a journal in your stepmom's backpack. And then, you know, because I think she said she, her, her stepdaughter borrowed her backpack. Right. And then returned it to her with the journal in it. It's like, um, interesting. So she has some questions here. Okay. She says, if she has a clear, if she has clear tendencies toward borderline personality disorder, what can her therapist do given that she's underage? What do you think, Bob? DBT. Can they do DBT? I mean, that just makes sense. Sure. Uh, right. So... Uh, so in other words, it's like, um, well, I think another question that she's asking is, well, she's underage, so you can't diagnose with, with borderline oh, right. and therefore can't address it. I guess, I think that's what she's asking about. What do you think about that? Um, I don't know what makes the diagnosis all that important. I think you just want to treat what you see in front of you, sure. which is a kid who's really angry and in a lot of pain, and just use what means are necessary or are available to do that, and not get too strung out on can we or can we not call it this thing. Right. I don't. I don't think there's any value in that. Right. Totally. That I say that to people all the time. That exact thing of just like, does it matter what label we put to it? We know what we see which yeah. is she's struggling, right. she's angry, she's having trouble with her emotional regulation, she is um, suffering from some trauma or of some kind, yeah. and she's anxious, and she gets sad a lot, and she gets angry a lot, and let's help her with those emotions. And whether that's borderline or not, it doesn't really matter. doesn't really matter. Yeah. My opinion on this is, um, you know, there's this weird technical... Uh, cut off, shall we say, right. that you can't diagnose uh, a underage person, un- meaning under 18, with a personality disorder. Because the reasoning is that all teenagers have personality disorders is, is the way that people joke around about it. It's like, uh, in other words, having emotional um, chaos and not knowing who you are and uh, having difficulty with emotions as your hormones are, you know, changing is par for the course. And so it's, it's a very, uh, irresponsible thing to just look at a teenager and go, Oh, you're borderline or something. Right. But on the other hand, uh, what is it about that magical day upon turning 18 that suddenly that's all different? Sure. Um, so, there's, there has to be a gradient, right? There has to be some kind of clinical opinion and, and wisdom that comes into that. Yeah. And you can absolutely look at a 15-year-old. I think her, her stepdaughter was something around that age. Maybe she never said. Um, 
that uh, you can you can say a lot of things are pointing to borderline personality. Now, it could be a teenage phase, but it's looking awfully like a uh, there's a possibility that this person is going to have difficulty with a borderline personality for for quite some time and uh maybe maybe not maybe, you know but that's true of anyone of any age really you can look at a 25 year old and say the same thing there, cuz there's no biomarker for borderline it's it's clinical assessment and opinion and um so a lot of times they'll talk about teenagers as having budding borderline you know they call they call them budding borderlines um which i think is is fine but i I have no problem diagnosing teenagers with borderline. I, I've 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 treated enough borderline teenagers to know uh, the difference between what is a phase or you know because you can have you can have teenagers who have some rough years and in their adult life have a totally stable personality, and I, I feel like I've been with enough families to be able to tell the difference. Um, now. Whenever I venture into those conceptualizations, I never am sure of myself because uh, of clinical experience has taught me that I, I know barely anything about the human mind, let alone <laughs> like uh, trying to predict the future. Um, but, you know, um, now, but what does it mean for me to conceptualize someone as borderline? It's basically what you're saying, which is like, it doesn't really matter. I'm still observing like a, a real human with a real set of, of behaviors and tendencies and stuff. And it's like, if I label that borderline or not, it doesn't really matter. Um, and, uh, and it uh, also means borderline means something different. I'm convinced it's something, every clinician has a different version of borderline in their head. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and so, uh, Whereas with other disorders, it's less so that way, you know, major depression is, is a fairly, uh, when I talk with other clinicians and we're talking about major depression, I usually have confidence that I know what's in their head. When I hear people talk about borderline, I have no idea what's going on in their head. Um, anyway. Yeah. So, but I think what this patron is getting so let me ask some other questions that she said would the therapist proceed as though a diagnosis had been made without naming the diagnosis to the client or her parents so i think we answered we that kind of answered that yeah, yeah. and her, her other question here is would would there be room to discuss the those suspicions before she turns 18 in order for her and her and her family to educate themselves about the condition i think we kind of answered that question too yeah um i think what's really happening here with the patron is a sort of classic uh, scenario that annoys me as a family therapist in that the we have a teenager who is suffering and willing to go to therapy, which is great. She's going to therapy. The individual therapist occasionally meets with the parents, but this stepmom is feeling neglected essentially by the treatment plan. Uh, the stepmom, the patron who's writing in, she's like, I don't really feel, I don't really know what's happening. I don't, does the therapist know that this kid has these problems that I'm seeing? It, um, what am I supposed to do? Uh, I, I feel like what this family needs is a family therapist or this therapist needs to switch to family therapy or something or do both or something. Yeah. Uh, because as we can tell, the, the teenager isn't the only one who's suffering here. And they're in a classic situation in which the, the biological father, is, so, so the patron is writing in and saying, I, I'm leaving the house not only for my safety, which I totally honor, by the way. Absolutely. Which I, I, if, if I were in your shoes, patron, I might do the exact same thing. <laughs> it's just like to be afraid that you're, that your stepchild is going to kill you or maim you or poison you or, or I don't know what, right. or, or try to blackmail you or get into your email or something and, and use something against you, like, because they have, uh, you know, 
self-professed intentions to do so in their diary, like I would be terrified of that. Absolutely. Um, so, 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 uh, the, but the biological father is, is extremely dedicated to his daughter. Right. Sure. And so he's, and it sounds like, uh, the, the daughter is targeting the stepmom with all of her, um, energy. And so the father is like trying to hold on to his relationship with his daughter um, and he can't always defend his the ste- his wife because that'll aggravate the daughter. And then the stepmom is looking to the husband of like, how come you're throwing me under the bus here? And the step and the father is like, well, I don't know what to do. I love you and I want our relationship to work out, but I also love my daughter, and I can't I can't just give up on my daughter. And I hope that you stick around. But if you need to leave, then I guess that's what's going to happen. And then the and then the stepmom feels hurt by that, sure. and like, what am I doing here? And, right. and so it becomes this. Uh, it's a very it's a very common scenario that I see, and a family therapist can help with that shit. <laughs> you know, there's no reason why, or a couples therapist. There's no reason. Uh, what I always tell couples in situations like this is, the two of you are dealing with an extremely difficult situation. There you know, um, there are a lot of people suffering in this way and almost no one talks about it. And it is extremely stressful to have a child who is self-injuring, who has disordered eating, who is making threats, who is out of control, who is doing God knows what with who, who is, you know, uh, where is this kid heading? You know, the shame of it all, the, Mm -hmm. the pain on a minute by minute basis in this in this home it's stressful and there's no reason why that has to destroy your marriage is what i say but you will have a tendency to turn on each other because of the stress you'll have a, you'll have an impulse to try to blame someone and you'll turn to each other or you'll be in a bad mood and you'll you'll you won't have the luxury of of giving each other grace and that's going to happen but you it would be a tragedy that this outside thing to your marriage would destroy something good and so that's sort of the basis that we start from uh, it doesn't always work um, of course but but i get a lot of head nods from from parents who are like oh yeah that's you know because they be, a lot of times particularly if they have their own traumas from their own lives parents will become convinced that it's the other parent's fault. Mm. You know, they'll just be like, because they're looking at the situation and there's, you know, like the stepmom might be looking at the situation being like, I, ha- well, I, ha- you know, I have this completely out of control stepdaughter and I want my husband, her biological father to be more stern. That's the answer. You know, he needs to be more firm with her, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's like, maybe, but there's probably no answer to the question. There's probably no solution to, to magically fixing, you know, and I'm not hearing this from the patron. The patron's not saying that, but, but I see a lot of that, of, of like, um, like, this, like a common scenario would be the stepmom would be blaming the father for not being, uh, you know, firm enough with boundaries. And then the biological father would blame the stepmom for being a little cold and being a little... Um, uh, too quick to judge or too quick to be stern or something. And when I talk with parents in that situation, I'm telling them, look, you're both right. There's no, both bo- both of you could adopt either one of your uh, plans here with the kid and the problem would still be there. <laughs> nice. So, so there's, there's nothing, uh, take it from me, uh, you're kind of doomed a- and there's no reason to blame yourself for, for that or to nitpick each other's parenting style. Um, and, and, you know, feel free to have conversations and feel free to advocate for a different parenting style, but, uh, and feel free to improve your parenting style. But my guess is, is that her suffering is going to persist for a while while we, you know, figure this out anyway. Nice. Um, so let's see, do we have anything else to say to her about? Uh, the situation. No, I think that's as far as I can tell from the question she asked. 
we covered it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I recommend finding a family therapist who specializes in difficult teenagers. There are many family therapists who specialize in that. And I would suspect that they would um, uh, know what they're doing. Uh, oh, the other thing is, is patron, you can actually request, I don't, maybe, maybe you already have, a, a private meeting with the therapist just to, to, to level with them and, and just say, so I just want to have a private meeting with you just to kind of, and maybe the therapist won't go for that. I don't know. But you could just be like, look, what, what's your plan here? You know, because here's, I've, I'm feeling really hopeless over here and I don't really see any movement happening. And feel free to do that. As a therapist myself, I like it when people say that to me. And it gives me the opportunity to be, oh, great, thanks for telling me. I, I'm glad you're telling me that you're actually concerned about my approach and you're worried that I'm not doing anything. <laughs> uh, please, you know, Because then it gives me an opportunity to have a conversation about that. Some therapists don't like that confrontation. And I say, that's fucking bullshit. <laughs> you know? It's like, imagine you go to your dentist and you know, you've been sending your daughter to the dentist for weekly appointments and it's not fixing the pain in their jaw or something. And you just go to the dentist and be like, so what's your plan? Like, what's, how, come this isn't, how come this isn't fixed yet? Any dentist will go, oh, well, here's the plan. And here's, here's the probabilities and here's my thoughts. And you can get a second opinion if you want. Like, or at least they should be. And it's the same in therapy. You should, as a therapist, be able to justify what the fuck you're doing. And you shouldn't be threatened by that conversation, <laughs> you know. Now, if you're not confident with that conversation, then get confident with that conversation. Or say you're not confident, you know, as a therapist to be like, it's okay to, it's okay as a therapist to be like, you know what, tell you the truth, I'm shooting in the dark. I, I, you know, I've gotten some consultation on this and I've tried this and that, but, you know, I'm like you, I'm, I have a similar feeling. Like, I, I don't know if, I don't know if this is working. So, but at the very least, you, as a ther the therapist should not be upset by that question, and the therapist should not reject you or have some kind of weird reaction to that. They should be able to respond to those questions. And um, do you know what I'm talking about, Bob? I like what you're talking about. <laughs> do you ever have those questions? I, I get the impression like you would be good at being able to respond to those questions and always have been is my guess. Oh, I have my moments of defensiveness from time to time. I don't treat families, so I don't have that particular experience, but I do get feedback from my people. And I often say to them when I'm orienting them to the fact that I want them to give me feedback is sometimes I make mistakes. Sometimes I'm a bonehead. I really want this to be a good experience for you and be helpful. And if it's not, and you've got this thing going on inside you, then it won't be. So I want you to talk to me, even though I know it's really hard to talk to these therapist types. Yeah. It is hard to talk to these therapist types. I'm a therapist, and I have a hard time talking to therapist types about their therapy. Yeah. I'll still do it, but... Have you ever done that? Have you ever told a therapist, uh, I don't like this and that, or what What the hell are you doing? Like, yeah. What, do you mind sharing? Like, what? No, we, we did it with the couples therapist. We said to her, we want you to do this thing. And she said, uh, okay. And then she did it. And then she didn't do it. And we said, you know, we don't think this is really going in the right direction. And she said, okay, well, maybe, you know, maybe I'm not the person for you or, you know, whatever. And we, we parted ways. Was it non-defensive or? It was through email. So, you know, you never really can tell. And I always yeah. wonder. And one time, a different couples therapist, haha, -ha, um, same thing. We said, you know, we really like you to do this thing. And she said, okay. And then she stopped doing it. And eventually we stopped going to her. But I, I, it's been a while, but I believe we let her know we were stopped. Oh, you know, that might not be true. I might not have said to her. You just sort of drifted away. Yeah. It yeah. might have been it might have been the second one. It is hard to talk to therapist yeah. types. Have you ever just said to a therapist, like in session, like made more micro issues, like, you know, I didn't like it that that happened or or this happened? I I, I did. I once I said to a therapist, You talk too much. <laughs> it was it was mortifying. I think I think it was really hard for her. Were you were you a counselor at the time? Oh, yeah, this was about three years ago. <laughs> and and I was sort of horrified with myself. I mean, I was telling her what I really believed. Yeah. And um, she, you know, she didn't freak out. I think it was a hard moment for both of us. And then, um, you know, we digested it. We stuck together. And later she said to me that she really appreciated that feedback. 
that she wondered about that and she had been thinking about that with her other clients and had changed some of her approach. That's funny. Yeah. And the person I see now, I, I suspect, would be amused, delighted, maybe maybe anxious because he's pretty upfront about that sort of thing too, but would want that kind of feedback. And Yeah. Yeah. You say, you say mortified and that is a good word for it. One of the most mortifying uh, realizations or events that you can have as a therapist is is not only to realize yourself that you're talking too much, yeah. but to have a client tell you yeah. you're talking too much. <laughs> it, it is a it, there's so many layers of shame involved in that, you know, because that is prime directive for for therapists is listen. And and by definition, an extension of that, uh, stop talking. You know, if if it's not helpful, you know. And I and I think another layer is, I think a lot of us, uh, maybe therapists in particular, just have a general shame if someone if we've been talking to someone and someone isn't interested. You know, to to walk away to have to hear through the grapevine. It's just like man, you know that guy is so boring or that guy talks about the dumbest stories or that guy repeats himself over and over again mm-hmm. or you know it's very there's something deep about that sh- sort of shame and um that i felt you know j- for myself because i'm a very talkative slightly narcissistic person <laughs> and so i know exactly what that feels like and i probably talk too much as a therapist sometimes mm. um uh and as an instructor too by the way <laughs> Um, so I can absolutely, uh, uh, identify with feeling mortified, but on the other hand, it's like maybe even a a primer directive as a therapist is if a, if a client or a student or a supervisee has a complaint about me, I am freaking responsible to respond to that. It is my responsibility to hear that and, and like provide safety and prove to them that they have every right to tell me. So whenever I hear stuff like that, I instantly go into this mode of just like, thank you for telling me. Right. I'm going to tell you, uh, it doesn't make me feel great, but you, I'm glad you've told me and you should tell me. And now that gives me the opportunity to change my ways. Um, and let me talk for 20 minutes about how I'm going to change my ways, you know, about not talking so much. <laughs> well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thank you for joining us out there. Thanks for joining me, Bob, to talk about this. Yeah, thank you. And to patrons, let, let us know what you think about what we're saying and give us some updates. We uh, want feedback, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Did we talk too much? Um, that does it for that episode. Thanks for joining us. Please take care of yourself because... You deserve it.